and we'll go from current slide. And David decided to grace us with his attendance today. Okay. <clears throat> Question? I'm oh, sorry. I wasn't here last Thursday. What did we do? Okay, you weren't here last Thursday. What? Um, what, what, what was, um, uh, what did we, what activities did we do? Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just, yeah, you didn't have a lab last Thursday. Uh, uh, not a lab. We had a test last Thursday. That's yeah. right. The lab that we were going to try to do was the field trip. And <clears throat> I'm recording now, so let's go on and hit that. I have emailed at least twice. Second time, I actually copied his wife on the email and still haven't gotten a response. Usually, she will see it and tell him, yeah, you got an email from Charles. I know both of them. That hasn't worked yet. I've called the station at various times of the day and left messages. The only time I got to talk with a person, I sort of didn't get to talk with them because they were on air at the time. I couldn't hear anything they said except they were on air and that I couldn't leave a message. So uh, I tried back later and got a voicemail. So uh, I called after 8 this morning and they said our off, our hours are 8 to whatever, you know, but I still got the voicemail then, left another message. Um, I don't know. I hope we'll hear something, but if we don't, you know, can't do anything with it. We got uh, to today, Thursday, and Tuesday. Yes. Um, did you try the other uh, one did that too? I can't hear you. Sorry. Have you tried the other lady with that too? I can't hear you. Have you tried the other lady that does the too? Uh, I don't have a way to get in touch with her unless someone directs me to her. Uh, there's not a direct number they they forward you. And every time when there's no one there, it always goes to him uh, because I guess he's a senior meteorologist. Um, if you're talking about Miss uh, uh, Harmony Mendoza, uh, she's the one that the last time I don't even have her email address. Um, could be that H. Mendoza will get it there. I don't know if it will or not, but um, I'll try that if nothing else works. But uh, the uh, I keep trying to call the station at different times, hoping they'll connect me with someone else that then can get the word to Jerry or that can take care of us. And so far, I've been un unable to get to talk with but one person there. Well, someone answered the phone one time. I said, I need weather, and they put me back, and I got the voicemail again. Well, I, I explained everything to that person. I said, look, I need to set up a field trip. We're here. I'll, I'll forward you. And they, they didn't get the word to him either, I guess. I don't know. I just don't know what's happening because no one's gotten back in touch with me. So we'll uh, have to play it by ear. I'll try again after class today. And uh, if nothing, say I have two hours in the morning in the office, I'll try again then too. Uh, but the trouble is, if I don't know by in the morning, Basically, I'd like to know today because if we are going to go and I need to get in the van, I have to get all that paperwork done tomorrow so I can get the van, you know, on, on Thursday. And I don't even know when I'll get the van on Thursday because it's I've got classes straight through. What I think I would have to do is come by the Birmingham campus, uh, pick up the van, and drive on here teach my classes and then, you know, so I don't know. I, I've got to work that out and it's not a trivial matter. So I can't do anything until I hear from them. And um, now, there are some other issues coming up. Uh, what are other questions? Okay, yeah. All right. Um, I was reading this book uh, last night. And what the one says, how many different oceans are actually on Earth's surface? Is it three oceans on Earth's surface? Okay, wait. 
This is in the back of the book? Number 31, you said? Okay. <laughs> uh, that's what I would have said, too. But the book is saying you want ocean on Earth, and you think that's a, that's a good thing. Oh, oh, okay, wait, 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 okay, I knew, okay, I see what they're saying now. Okay. How many different oceans, meaning different pools of water, okay. all the waters are mixed constantly. It's just that we divide them into Pacific Atlantic because the water from one goes into the other, into the other. The water so is circulating. The runs into the Atlantic eventually? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the water's always moving. And we haven't gotten to that part of the chapter yet. We'll get there. In fact, it's coming up. Well, I thought we had. Let's see. Yeah, remember, let me go back a slide or two. Yeah. The Earth's seawater completely mixed. In other words, every drop of water that was in the Atlantic is mixed with water in the Indian, it was mixed with water in the Pacific, it's mixed with water in all the sea, you know, stuff. A complete mixing happens every 2,000 years. So, in effect, there's one big body of water we just sort of separated so we can name and say which one we're talking about. That was a nebulous question. Yeah. And then 32 At, says the largest of the three coastal ocean regions on the top Earth is Atlantic, Pacific, Indian. Okay, Sea which one? 32? 32. 32. The largest of the three principal ocean regions of the Earth, mm -hmm. see they put in the regions there, yeah. is, and it would have to be B, right? Right, Pacific, right. Huh? Yes, B, B, correct. Right, oh yeah, but, yeah, see the difference in those, how many different, that was the key word there, different oceans are actually on the Earth's surface, there's just one ocean, because the oceans aren't any different from one another. That's what the key was there. And then the 32, the largest of the pre-principal ocean regions of the Earth, that meant, how do we name them, Se separate them. I had never looked at those before, but yeah. So that was most questions, and certainly I don't pick a test question that's ambiguous like that, you know, so, or I try not to anyway. Uh, and again, this chapter, I had to do a lot of filtering to get to, so maybe whoever wrote the question for this was a little out there, <laughs> because uh, now that I think about it, I did have to do a bit more be a bit more diligent in my picking of the questions. Okay. I think we were here, where we left off last time. Uh, but l let me go over a few announcements first. Um, remember I said last week that I had to go to a meeting down in Opelika at Southern Union it's a statewide meeting for curriculum development, and I was tasked to go there. Uh, we left at 6 in the morning, and we got back earlier than I had feared we would. We got back at, uh, I think we were back on campus, close to 3.30, maybe a little after 3.30. Anyway, it was a nine and a half hour day even then. And uh, so I'm only supposed to work four hours on Friday, so I asked my boss if I could have this Friday off too, and he said yes. So I will not be on the Birmingham West Campus this coming Friday, 8 to 12, like I usually am. There's just some things we've got to take care of, and I couldn't... My only free time during the week is Friday afternoon, and I lost it last Friday, so I'm going to try to uh, make up for that this Friday. Okay, so that's uh, that. Now, next week is... It won't affect this class any, I hope, anyway. But next week is going to be a weird, weird week for me. Um, I think I told you all early in the term, probably first day, that I have a mild case of leukemia. So I have to see my hematologist usually two or three times a year. He has to check all the, you know, do the blood work and stuff like this. So 
my next appointment is coming up Tuesday. He only sees patients on Tuesday mornings. So it won't bother this class any, but I will not be here from 9 o'clock until probably getting pretty close to noon. Okay? My appointment's at 10.40, but I have to leave. Uh, I have to be there at 9.40 for blood work, and then I have to, that means I have to leave campus by 9. So I'll come in at 8, teach my 8.30 class for 30 minutes, leave, go there, miss my nine, uh, 10 o'clock class, and probably miss the first part of my 11.30 class, and hopefully I'll be back sometime between 11.45 and, and 12 o'clock. But I'll be back for this class, so uh, knock on wood. Okay, he doesn't see patients after in the morning, so I'll be back here by 1, I hope. Okay, so... Uh, but don't look for me earlier in the day. I may be back in the office by 12.30, no, 12.45 is when I normally eat lunch, so I may, I'll may i probably be back by 12.45. I'll be in the office 12.45 for lunch. Okay, and my work study student said you came by this morning. You're wrong. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Tuesday, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm in the office 8 to 10. Uh, Tuesday and Thursday, 8 to 8.30. Uh, and then the, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm in class on Tuesday and Thursday from 8.30 until 5.45, but I'm in the office 8 to 8.30, and then uh, uh, the other time that I'm in the office is 12.45 to 11.15, I mean 1.15, right before this class, and then right after the class is 15. Uh, but today, I'm almost certain we're going to finish early, so there'll be plenty of time to pick up that then. Okay. So anyway, Tuesday, I won't be on campus from 9 till somewhere close to 12 because my doctor's appointment. Then on Thursday, and why is this all happening in the same week? I don't know. On Thursday, as you can. Okay. Um, On Thursday of next week, this isn't this Thursday, Thursday of next week, I signed up, you're supposed to sign up for a uh, retirement seminar. So they make sure they know you're retiring and you've got all the paperwork and you, you understand what you've got to do to retire. And they only offer certain ones and you tell them which city you want to go to. They never offer any in Birmingham or Bessemer. I've never seen them off of one there. But they do, the closest for here was Tuscaloosa. So I said Tuscaloosa. So they assigned me the day, and that's next Thursday. Okay, not tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, but the following Thursday. I'll be going all day that day. Okay, but that's after this class is over. That's the first day of the second mini term. Or, and some of you are taking second mini term. So what you'll do then, I'll put an assignment out on Blackboard, and you will need to do the assignment and turn that in, and that will be your attendance for Thursday, that Thursday. So uh, I'll be going all day that day, so I may be back by 545, but you know, I don't think very many people will be hanging around that long. Yeah? Yeah, I'll be here in the fall, too. Yeah. Say again? Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, the, the second mini-term course in the fall is usually offered a little bit later because the automotive mechanics have block schedules and they go till 3 in the fall, but they only go till 1 in the spring. So I can start the second mini-term class at 1.15 in the spring, but it has to be 3.15 in the fall, so it goes till 7.45 at night then. So, Pardon me? Well, I have earlier classes, but not physical science. We only offer them once a term. Uh, so, second mini term this time is the same time as this one. The second mini term in the fall will be later. Or it usually it has been. And I assume it will be still, because last fall I thought there wouldn't be any auto mechanics in there, but there were three, so we had to offer it that time. 
Anyway, uh, so next Thursday, not this Thursday, but next Thursday I'll be doing all that. Then that last, the next Friday, not this Friday, this Friday I won't be on campus at all, but next Friday I will be on campus, Birmingham West Campus, 8 till somewhere close to 12. I have, uh, again, all in one week. A dermatology appointment. They, they schedule once a year, and it happened to come up this coming Friday. So I told them I wanted it in the afternoon. They said they would get it to me then, but I don't remember what time. If it's after 12.45, which I hope it is, I'll be on campus till 12. If it's right at 12, I'll have to leave by 11.15, 11.30 to get there. So, but I hope they gave it to me late enough in the afternoon that I could uh, make my four hours on Friday. So anyway, those are weird week coming up next week. Yes? So I'm next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. No, no, yeah. no. No, we can't be. It is. I thought you said you were going to give us out. This Papers back this Thursday. Um, yeah. And then the final will be next Tuesday. We could be going to the weather station that same day and come back and take the final. But the final is not going to take long for you to take. Uh, so you will have time if that works out. But I hope we can go to Thursday. But I won't know until I find up from. And like I said, I'll check again. I checked emails while I was eating lunch today. Nothing's come in. Yes? I was right. I was right. Okay. I hope it'll happen. And I'm going to keep calling. I'm going to keep emailing. Them, but... I'm running out of term, you know, in time, but we'll see what happens. Okay, but anyway, those are things for the next two weeks, and the final will be next Thursday. Now, today, what are we doing today? We're in chapter 24, the last chapter, and we really don't have that much more to go, so we're going to finish this fairly soon, then we'll have the lab, and then, basically... It's going to be a good time for makeups, okay, because there's nothing else to cover new. But it'll be a good time for people to catch up on things they may have missed. Now, what does that leave for next Tuesday? Hopefully it'll be the field trip, but not necessarily. But if it's not the field trip, basically all we got to do, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thursday, this Thursday. Um, hopefully it'll be the field trip, but if it's not the field trip, all we have left to do is the chapter 24 test. So that will definitely be this Thursday, uh, and um, if we do go on the field trip, then when we get back, anyone who wants to take the test can take it then. If they want to wait and take it on Tuesday when they have the final, they can do that too. But, but... Thursday, boy, how am I going to get all the papers back and get to the field trip and stuff? What you'll have to do is come, well, it depends on what time they take us. They usually say come at 2. If they come at 2, we've got to leave here at 1.15. So I won't have time to return papers then. So um, it'll have to be returning papers after we get back from the field trip. And some people, if they don't come back, you aren't going to get your papers back until the following Tuesday. So please come back after the field trip. Um, now, if I get everything in, and let me just go over right now. Research papers, I've gotten five so far out of 21 students. Well, maybe 20 students now. So I have a quarter of them in. Lab one, I'm still missing one, two, three, three lab ones. Test one, I'm missing one. Lab two, I'm missing one, two. Test two, I'm missing one, two. Lab three, I've got probably half of them in. Test three, well, it just goes on from there. The numbers just keep picking up more and more. So... There's none of them that were anywhere close to getting everyone except the ones I just named, or I'm only missing one or two. So please get these in. 
Today would be a great time to make up any tests and any labs, get them in so I can get them back to you um, whenever I can get them back to you. Okay. So we're running out of term. I want to get everything off my desk by next Thursday. The beginning of class, if we don't go on the field trip, at the end of class, when we come back from the field trip, if we do that. All right. Any questions on anything we've done so far and where we're going from here? So today, we'll finish the chapter, have the lab. The lab is a paper lab. You'll do it here in class. You'll use your books and, uh, and look up the answers. Okay? Thursday, we will have the test on Chapter 24. Uh, hopefully, it will be after the field trip. If we don't go on the field trip, that's all we got scheduled. Now, here's another thing that we could do. If you need another lab score and would like another lab score and we don't get to go on the field trip, then Thursday could be a day that you report on your research paper. And if you make a report, you get 25 points what do you mean, on, on your research paper. Whatever you did your research paper on, just make a 5 to 10 minute report to class of what you learned in that paper. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now that's if we don't go on the field trip. Okay. If we do go on the field trip, then we won't have time for that probably. But then uh, the last Tuesday, the day of the final exam, Sam, and that may also be the day of the field trip. I uh, hope not, but if it is. Uh, but if we have the field trip that day, there probably won't be time for pizza. But if we don't have the field trip that day, if we have the field trip on Thursday, then let's plan to have pizza uh, at 1.15 and then have the uh, uh, test afterwards. You rock that. Okay. Well, I'm hard as one anyway. Never mind. Okay. All right. Never mind. All right. Where we left off last time, we were talking about the, let me just go back one slide. We were talking about swells, waves, that kind of stuff. Well, what happens when these things, which go over the open ocean, I was on the ship in the Navy, you can see the swells and the waves, We'd be miles from anywhere. They're still out there. They're always out there. Okay? What happens when you get close to shore? Okay? Several things happen. One thing, and I don't know if they have a good graphic on this. I don't think they do. That's a little bit of one, but not really much of one. Let's see if the next one. Yeah, this may become... Uh, it's not even a very good one either. No. Okay. I thought there was something in the book, too, but it doesn't really show that well. So, anyway. One thing that happens, the waves, if they come in straight toward the beach, which these are showing they're doing, then they just come in and go out and come in and go out. Okay? But if the waves are coming from an angle to the beach, and that's why I said there's not a good graphic on this, they bend the shoreward side. Let's say here is the beach right here, and if the waves are coming in like this, this end of the wave is going to hit the beach before this end does. It slows down, and they bend. They refract. That's what a refraction is, is the bending of the uh, waves. The shore side wave slows first, and then the wave front bends toward the shore. Okay? This doesn't show it. None of the figures show it very well. Uh, and I think the a previous edition showed it a lot better than this. I guess the best picture of this might be the one at the bottom of page 622, figure 2419, and you see here the waves hit 
you can't, it's still not a very good picture, but they're bending toward the shore. Uh, you see these out here are closer than the ones over here because those waves hit first. Now here there's a promontory, so that bends it too, the other way. So that's what they mean by refraction. The wave fronts bend toward the shore. Okay? Now, another thing that happens. The waves, the deep water waves are coming in in waves and swells like this. Everything's fine. But remember from an earlier slide that the, and this is a weird combination here, the wave height is here and the wave, the water motion is sort of a circular motion. It doesn't get carried this way or that way, it's sort of a circular motion. It goes up and down, up and down, goes a little forward, a little back, a little forward, just follows that. But then beneath that, beneath the trough, the circulation gets less and less until you're, and this is strange, one half wavelength, there's one wavelength, one half wavelength down from uh, the middle of the wave height, past that line, there's no movement at all. Okay, so all your movement is happening in one wavelength down, or half a wavelength down from the, uh, the center of the wave, which is it, it's a weird combination, one half of the wavelength this way from the middle of the wave height that way, that determines where. So, that's where the motion's occurring, no motion down here, so basically what that means is, <clears throat> Okay. Out here in the deep water, the waves are just doing what they do, and the circulation is almost straight up and down. Okay. But then when you get near shore, and this starts running into the friction of the land that's underneath, then the top of the waves go faster than the bottom of the waves. So that's why you have the crests now start breaking over the troughs. And that's why they call them breakers, or surf zone breakers. Out here that doesn't happen because everything is moving as it should. When you start running into the bottom down here, the friction drags this back and moves, but the top part of the waves move over, so they start breaking over the top. So that's why they call them breakers. At depths less than the wavelength, than the wave height, okay, the lower part slows and the top part breaks forth. Okay? That's why they call them breakers. Uh, the surf is the breaker formation zone. That's where those guys that get out there and gals that get out there on the surfboards and ride the waves when they're breaking. Out here it's no fun at all. Okay? But here, where they're breaking over the top, this is where they get in it and start breaking. And that all de uh, partially depends on the topography of the bottom of the ocean. Okay? The whatever's down there, what kind of drop off you have, and, and that type of thing. They say that some of the best waves anywhere are off the coast of Hawaii. I think the northeast shore seems to be just the best. The waves come in well there, the the bottom is such that it really makes the fine uh, surfing there. I don't know, oh, here, okay, no. Okay, the water is transported toward the shore by the breakers, okay? The water is coming up here with the breakers, but guess what? It hits the beach and then runs back down, okay? Now, I think these two arrows don't make sense. <laughs> I would have put the forward arrow on top and the down and the return arrow on the bottom. It really doesn't matter, but that's indeed what happens. The water runs back down here, and that also contributes to the breaking, the surf breaking over the top because not only do you have friction with the bottom, you also have 
returning water here that drags the, the base backwards again and makes the, the surf break over the top. So the water is transported toward the shore by the breakers must return. That creates what they call the undertow, which is these arrows down here. I would have put that one on the bottom. Direct return of water under the breakers. If you've ever been to the beach and you stood out there in sort of the shallow water, you'll feel water hitting you this way but dragging that way. That's the undertow. It's pulling back out. Okay? Direct return of the water under the breakers. Now, the last thing mentioned here is the longshore currents. That's motion parallel to the shore. Let me see if I can get a graphic that will show that. This one doesn't really. Um, in fact, I can't really figure out what this one is supposed to be showing. Um, the, the, the best I can figure is how irregular the breakage. All this looks pretty good except for these indentations here, but they don't ever describe what causes that. Okay? It's something about the uh, characteristic of what's underneath the water. Okay? And they don't do a good job of that. But that's not what they mean by longshore currents. I think this one, yeah, this is the one that shows that. Okay? Now, that's motion parallel to the shore, and this produces what they call riptides, uh, especially when you enter a channel. Again, you're not going to see the channel from on top, but if there's a channel underneath there, that could be really dragging out. Now, that's what my guess, but this is only a guess, is happening here, here, and there. Here to a great extent, there to a pretty great extent, here to a lesser extent. You probably have the rip uh, tides pulling back. There must be little channels under there where more of the water goes. But that's only a guess. Yes? So rip tides are different from rip currents? Um, they're, they're, they're similar, okay? They're... they're tied with each other, okay? Um, I think, according to this, they're actually saying the same thing, the, the rip tides and the rip current. Now, this longshore current, I don't, I don't know if you've messed around at the beach much. I had never very much, but when after I got married, my, uh, my wife's family loved to go to the beach every two or three years. They plan a special trip down to the beach. So I started going to the beach, and yeah, it was okay, but I liked shade. <laughs> there was not much shade on the beach. I would stay under the umbrella as much as possible. But uh, I would get out and, and, and mess in the water some, try to do a little body surfing, that kind of stuff. But here's something I noticed. I would go out from wherever we were set up, go out and start doing it and go back out and doing that. When finally I get tired, I come back to shore and I wouldn't recognize anything. And that's because these longshore currents, which I never realized, were dragging me down the beach. And then I'd have to figure out which way they were, try to figure out, by the, well, that looks like where we came from. And I would walk then for, it seemed like at least a quarter of a mile, before I'd finally get back up to where everybody was. It had those longshore currents will do this. You don't realize they're doing it. And that probably comes from that bending of the waves, that diffraction, refraction that we were talking about earlier. And they really can drag you right on down the beach. Now, uh, there's Eric. I assume it was a rip, tighter rip current, one or the other. Uh, when I was in the Navy, this is before I was married, I was stationed uh, my last year 
up in the Norfolk Portsmouth area, Virginia. And I had family that lived in Chesapeake and maybe one family lived in Virginia Beach. And one time my cousin and her family were going to the beach on a Sunday afternoon, so I went with them. Uh, they invited me and uh, I went with them. And we got out there, but it was pretty windy and it was a pretty rough day. But I thought it was okay, but I got into something that had to have been like a rip current or a rip tide, and I was trying to get back in, and I was getting pulled further and further out. I'm not a good swimmer, not a strong swimmer, but I was getting nowhere pretty fast. And fortunately, my cousin's husband, who was maybe a year or two older than me, a couple, three years older than me, and a good swimmer, uh, saw me and he went and helped me get out of that and to back to where it was. But it was, it was scary because it was dragging me out. I was trying to get back in and it seemed like for every stroke I took this way, it pulled me to that way. And it, it was not a pleasant experience at all. So they can be dangerous and you can't see them. You can't tell above that that's going on underneath. So that comes from this undertow, all these things contributing, and then if you get a channel under there, it, all this feeds into the same place. And if there's a lot of wind and, and motion that day, it can really get pretty strong. All right. Um, there is an interesting blurb. Let me see if there's anything more on shore effects. No. There's an interesting blurb at the top of page 623 called Rogue Waves. It's an unusually large wave that appears with the smaller waves and sometimes called a freak wave, whatever the name, generally one or a group of two or three waves more than twice the size of the surrounding waves. Okay. And they build up sort of a wall of water and uh, they talk about it, maybe it has to do with a storm front, something else, some of those effects we talked about before uh, of extraordinarily long period of time with the wind in the same direction, uh, like with a storm front coming in, and really builds up a or a number of these waves. Interesting read. I would recommend you read it. That's on uh, your 28, 14, I mean 24, 18. I'm sort of just like rogue waves, yeah. Okay, up at the top in the lavender section. There's underneath that an example of 24.5, and um, it basically is dealing with those numbers they talked about, wavelengths and and other things like this. It's just an exercise in messing with numbers. Well worth a look, and it helps you understand, but don't think I'm going to be asking you questions about that. And sometimes the way they do it, I find a bit bizarre too, but I think you can follow that pretty well. Um, so anyway, I'll let you decide whether you're going to do it. What's that? Earthquake what causes road waves? Uh, it can, but usually an earthquake causes what they call tsunamis, and we're going to get to that next, okay? I was trying to catch up. In fact, okay, here's the deal with tsunamis. If you remember back in when they went to a new edition, they, uh, see if I can remember this right. Yeah, they took tsunamis out of this section when they're talking about the ocean and put them back in the, I'm trying to remember which chapter it was, perhaps building the earth's surface? Let me see, yeah, 493. And I believe I mentioned to you at the time, when we got there, I said, Tsunamis are mentioned here, but there's no slide. The slide is going to show up in a later chapter. Here's where it's showing up in the ocean chapter, not in the 
earthquake chapter. So that's what's coming next. Though you won't find it in the book here, it is what's coming next here. This carries back to what we were saying before. And in your question about road wave, a tsunami would be an extremely large and powerful road wave if you called it that. I think they try to distinguish out. I think so. Uh, we'll see. Um, the can reach over eight meters in shallow water. Okay, this room is three meters tall. That would be almost a three-story building. So a two-story building, yeah, this is small. We will go right on the, the shore. And that's why a lot, well, those people who have the beach houses, sometimes they put them up on stilts. You know, for this reason. But you, usually if the tsunami's coming, it doesn't matter how you build it, you're going to get pretty slapped pretty hard. So what tsunamis are, are ocean waves created by earthquakes. So that answers that earlier question. It can be the largest of any of your ocean waves because this is caused by something not dealing with wind and things like this. This is dealing with underwater so the services. That, that, What's that? That means that it's something that happened underwater. Underwater, the earthquake, yeah. Okay. The underwater earthquake. Underwater earthquake, exactly. And a lot of them will happen down there when you have a ocean ocean subduction, and that really can't happen. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, the earth crust was moving, and then what caused those giant tsunamis that rolled above the cloud was the earth type cloud. I know it sounds like sci-fi, but yeah. I'm just saying. Um, More fi than sci. Yeah, I was just I was wondering, can, not, the, well, not so much of a similar thing, but can a tsunami get half as high as that? I'm not saying you go all the way to the cloud, can it just move it? But it doesn't well, have to go. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It doesn't have to go that high, but the power will be had. That right. the power will be had. Because I watched the the, right. like the real one. Mm -hmm. where, what's the name? I think it's the same guy killed in it. But anyway, they they saw it way what? Yeah. away, and they just thought it was just you know the water just coming in just to talk you know, and it was coming and coming. And when it came, it hit it took the whole village away. Right. It mm -hmm. was like. Yeah. It definitely just happens. Yeah. It's powerful. The, the, the um, power. Amazingly powerful. And, and this hits some of it. The physical characteristics, what you're talking about, the speeds approaching 700 kilometers per hour. Now, putting that in miles per hour, that would be about 420 miles per hour. I don't want to mess with that. Okay? If you see it out there, you better get moving because it's coming faster than right, right, you can right, run. Right, okay. Right. Okay. Uh, the wavelengths. This is just unbelievable. Two hundred kilometers. That would be one hundred twenty miles. Wavelength between crest and crest. And if there's a couple of them coming, yeah. Hey, you could, might make it. There's another one coming. The wave heights up to five tenths of a meter in deep ocean. That means out there in the deep ocean, that tsunami may not be more than this. But you see, most waves out there are really short. But now it's up this high. But by the time it gets to shore, it can reach eight meters. That would be between two and three stories of this building here. Okay, Taller than this part of the building, not quite as tall as the other part down there. Um, in shallow water. And that's at that speed, that much energy? Wow. Now, remember back when we did, I believe it was volcanic eruption? No, the biggest earthquake recorded before either these slides were done or the book was done was a nine. And that was, I think, in southern Alaska, okay? A 9.0 earthquake. There may have been some bigger than that since then, 
but not quite here. It caused a tsunami that traveled all the way down. From somewhere, I don't know exactly where it was, in southern Alaska. I don't know if it was along this part or this part. I'm guessing probably this part. Traveled down to the Hawaiian Islands, which I can't find. It is somewhere. Give it hard. Okay. Yeah. Traveled there. And that's a long distance, folks. I mean, it doesn't look like long on the map. Let's see, that distance there would be from Birmingham to Seattle. That's 3,000 miles. Yeah, it's enormous length and wiped out lots of that side of Hawaii. Now, this was many years ago. Alaska wasn't that populated then, and Hawaii wasn't as populated, but it was major, major, major. This kind of, like, uh, Ms. Lewis was saying, this kind of energy, unbelievable. I mean, just incredible. Okay. All right. So that's, tsunamis would have been in there somewhere. Okay. So what we've been talking about, okay. Now, this is another thing that's a little out of place from where we did it. We did the tides back in the moon chapter, and we had almost the same, um, not the same graphic, but we had one titled The Tides, and we talked about how the moon and the earth sun affected those, okay? Now they're talking about them just in terms of the water effect, produced by the earth-moon gravitational attractions already described back in chapter whatever that was, uh, 16, okay? The basic pattern of two high tides and two light low tides every 24 hours and 50 minutes, okay? So there will be some days, not very often, you only have either one high tide or one low tide, but most days you have two and two, okay? Every 24 hours and 50 minutes, okay? Now, these can produce strong reversing tidal currents in narrow bays. Uh, now, I read a novel, I guess it was. It was a mystery type thing. And this person had figured out almost a perfect way to dispose of a body. Happened to be in one of these narrow bays. Uh, they had performed the murder, so to speak, and then got the body out there at just the right time. The tides came in, and the tides went out, and the body was never seen again. So they had trouble proving there was a murder because there was no body, okay? And that was the whole thing. But that can be, and that's what it means by reversing tidal currents. Things look pretty normal at one time of day, but then the tide comes in, pretty strong current coming in, and then it stays there for a few hours, and then, very strong current, reverse, going back out. Now, a tidal bore is a wave moving rapidly up a bay as the tide rises, and then the guarantee it's going to be moving rapidly back down the bay as the tide recedes. Okay? So, uh, we don't have much of that around the Gulf of Mexico. Remember when we studied that, almost the minimum tidal effect on the planet is the Gulf of Mexico. It's about half a meter or something like that, which is almost nothing. So, yeah, you don't have anything like that here. I think uh, things like Nova Scotia, the way they're shaped and stuff like this, that may be bad. Um, there was some place over in England, I think, was where the... Uh, the story was done, and some of those bays uh, are shaped such that they really have severe. And as they say in London, on the Thames River, and London is quite a ways upstream. The Thames, I'm pretty sure, was to 
through the North Sea. I don't think it flows. I think it flows. If I'm not mistaken, it flows to the east. In London, quite away from the ocean, but they have a tidal bore that comes in and that goes out twice a day. Their sea level, their ocean, their river level is really affected by the tides. Okay. So. That's just following up with what we did back in chapter 16. Now we move to the next way that water mixes. Now, just trying to give you an idea of the organization here. Way back, last time we talked about movement of seawater. We said there were two major movers and shakers, okay? One was the waves, that's the surface movement. And we've just finished with those, and now we're going to the second of these, which are the currents, the ocean currents. Now, this is sort of hard to believe, but it, it's truly true. Uh, there are... Okay, what do you think of when I say a stream? Here we are in Alabama. I think of a stream as something sort of like Village Creek. You know, it's a small movement of water, okay? Much smaller than a river, but you know, a stream, something like that, okay? Well, that, that makes sense because land is dissected and it flows downhill. Top. That makes sense. But believe it or not, in your oceans, you have streams. Underneath the surface that are carrying water, okay, that are mixing, that are uh, the movement of water that you don't see on the surface. So these are streams transporting water over large oceanic distances along roughly the same path all the time, okay? That's what we mean by ocean currents. And these are produced by two major effects here. And I find it hard to believe that this one's really this major, but they claim it is. The density differences in seawater. Okay? Now, why are the dis different density differences? One reason would be temperatures. Colder water is denser than warmer water. So if you have cold water that's coming in, say, off melting glaciers and stuff, that may be moving down rapidly and in one direction while warmer water is moving in the other, okay? Density differences. The other thing that creates some density difference is possibly the uh, salinity, but they say that's not a major thing. But the saltier the water, the denser it is. But you see, why would water be saltier or less salty? Well, mixing with fresh water, like melting ice. So it seems like those were almost cancel out, but then to river flowing into the uh, a delta, that would produce a, a density difference. Okay? Now, number two here, wind flowing persistently in the same direction. Wait a minute, I thought that's what created waves and swells. Those are surface effects, but indeed that can also produce subsurface effects. I don't quite understand how it is, but all they do is say it, okay? Um, but uh, I say subsurface, they call these surface currents that are done this way. And that's usually what we talk about um, with some of the streams. The most famous to me of these streams, that probably not the most famous because I live in the U.S. near the East Coast, is the Gulf Stream. The Gulf, uh, that's what it's called, the Gulf Stream. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a minute too. Okay, so let's first talk about your density currents. The denser water displaces less dense water uh, in deeper basins. So if you have a really deep basin there, you don't see it from the surface, you don't realize it's there, 
The dense water goes down, displaces the less dense water. Now here are the three influences. Water temperature I talked about. If you have polar water coming in, that's colder and denser, that's going to move toward the bottom. And if you have a basin, it will move down there. It just keeps seeking the lowest level. Okay? The water in the tropics is warmer and less dense, and it gets displaced upward. Okay? So that creates movement. The cold water moving down deeper, pushing the warmer water up. So there's one, water temperature, creating a difference. Difference in density. The second, as I mentioned, was salinity. This is salt accumulation. And what are some of these mechanisms? Well, when you're freezing the water near the poles, you're freezing the water but leaving the salts. So the water around there gets more salt, more salty, and therefore denser. Okay? On the other hand, when you other thing that create increases the salinity, evaporation uh, in warm pockets like the Mediterranean Sea, that increases the density because you're losing water but not losing salt. But on the other hand from that, okay, if your ice is melting near the poles, then you've got fresh water coming in. If you've got runoff in warm pockets, as in the Mississippi River running downstream, the Nile, any of the major rivers dumping into the ocean, and where they dump into the ocean, they are now decreasing the salinity, so you have a change of uh, density because of that. And then tied with that, this runoff part, suspended sediments. These also produce denser situations. Turbidity currents to ocean oceanic basins. So yeah. Fresh water Say this again. Is the black sea a fresh fried water or a salt water? Most of the time, if they're named seas, they're somewhat salty. I don't know if it's as salty as the ocean, but I bet you it has a larger salt concentration. I bet you you wouldn't want to drink it. Well, so I don't know that for a fact. Here, Google. <laughs> See what, what you get there. Didn't used to be able to say that, but now y'all got instant answers all the time. Okay. So these suspended sediments will also, they produce what they call turbidity, meaning it's hard to see through type stuff, and these currents go to the oceanic basins too because of the increase in density. So some of this runoff into warm pockets would be lowering the density. But if it has a lot of suspended sediment, that would be increasing the density. So you have conflicting things going on here, but these currents tend to get moving in one direction and pretty much stay in that same general direction. Okay? Now this is a graphic that I find hard to believe. Soon they know what they're talking about. They're showing Greenland and Iceland up here. There's Greenland, there's Iceland. And evidently some pretty strong currents go through what they call the Denmark Strait. Now, why do they call it the Denmark Strait? Because Denmark was the colonizer for both Iceland and parts of Greenland. I don't know if they ever did the whole thing, but parts of Greenland. Denmark, a little country over here, and Europe was out trying to colonize as much as they could. This is a lot, lot of the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, Denmark came up here and, and got those. Okay? Now, this cold, dense water coming off the Arctic, up here, off the Arctic, down through the Denmark Strait here, heads downhill. Okay? <laughs> Uh, cold, this water just keeps going down. Now, this is 65 degrees north. Here is 30 degrees north. What does it run into here? Antarctic water? That means 
Water from down here has made its way up to 30 degrees north. And I think, how in the world? Okay? That's some really dense cold water that makes its way that far. Okay? Antarctic water makes its way as far as 30 degrees north. There must be some deep, deep areas in there. And this cold Arctic water is coming here almost running into the Antarctic water there. That I find amazing. That's water temperature density influencers. Okay? Now we move to the surface currents. Okay? These things that are caused more by um, All of these contribute somewhat to the surface current, but more the, what was the graphic that said? Yeah, the wind. Yeah, this is it. Wind blowing persistently in the same direction. So the next slide is this one. The one after that, that's the density. Here's the surface current. These are global circulation patterns maintained basically by patterns of prevailing winds. And remember, the winds don't always blow in exactly the same direction, but basically the prevailing winds dominate. Okay? And here's Antonio. Okay? All right, good deal. Um, predominantly by prevailing winds. They're also influenced by, guess what? Rotation of the Earth. Because the land has moved when the Earth does, the water sloshes around some, you know. So yeah, that contributes. And then where the land near the bottom, the direction of the land pulls the <coughs> lower depth of water, the upper depth tends to stay in place. So you have currents formed that way. Uh, these are surface currents, so, I, so it's mostly talking about those at the surface. The rotation of the Earth, the ocean basin shapes. Okay? Now what do we mean by that? What if you have, I don't know that you do, a ridge of mountains here? Okay? And the Earth is spinning like this, water will pile up against the ridge of mountains here and may have to go this way or you know because of the differences in ocean basin shape. Or, on the other hand, they may go deeper there. And what do they do? The cold water goes there, but also uh, other. So, boy, we don't understand beans about this. We just know they are influenced by this. Now, here's a term. I assume that's pronounced gyres or gyres. I don't know which it is. These are great systems of water circulation centered in the mid-latitudes. The direction is dictated by the Coriolis effect. So just like water, I mean air, spinning air, if it's rising air, that goes in a clockwise direction, if it's sinking air, that goes in a counterclockwise direction. Same thing here. In the mid-latitudes, let me use the Pacific. That would be up here or down here. Not near the equator, mid-latitudes here or here. The spinning of the Earth with the upward or downward mobility of the water, that creates these gyres. Great systems of water circulation centered in the mid-latitudes. Now, hopefully the next slide will uh, show that. Direction is dictated by the Coriolis effect. A low pressure will be counterclockwise in the north, clockwise in the south, the high pressure will be Clockwise in the north, counterclockwise in the south. What's that? Coriolis effect. Coriolis lights or something that you see in the Pacific North, Northwest. Let's say that one more time. Coriolis. Is that the lights that that happens when you? Oh, okay. No, that's aurora borealis. Okay. 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 Got you. What you talked about there? That's something. Okay. Let me try to explain that. Yeah. The North, I mean, the Earth, is a fairly relatively strong magnet. Okay? 
Okay? We have the north magnetic pole right there, pretty close to the actual north pole. The south magnetic pole is right here. It's further from the south pole, but they're down. And we had near the poles, that's where the field lines were the strongest. Okay? Now, you also have up in the atmosphere, ionosphere, that's one of the layers of the atmosphere somewhere up there. And you have cosmic rays coming from the sun. They have certain energy. When all those things are mixed together, especially the Earth's magnetic field lines interacting with those, they create those lights. In the north, it's called Aurora Borealis. And that stood for cold lights. They call them the northern lights, but aura in cold. The cold lights are the northern lights. The southern lights, here is the south magnetic pole. So they are, well, not many people live in Antarctica. The people do live in southern Australia, so they call it the Aurora Australis. You know, the Australian lights. Okay? That's almost the closest land map, uh, mass to the south uh, magnetic pole. So we call it Aurora Australis. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. South America is closer here, but you see the south magnetic pole is way over here. That's near here. It's, that's not being near the South Pole, it's being near the South Magnetic Pole. And that's pretty far off from the South Pole. And it's right below Tasmania, pretty much. That part of Australia. So it's Aurora Australis. And that's an interaction mostly of the Earth magnetic field and cosmic and ionic uh, things coming from the Sun and uh, Ironis. Our honest sphere. I can't talk. Here are some of the major currents. This figure is in your book on page, your page 2420. Um, I can almost guarantee the lines are not that even, and so I can't read them here. That's the western wind drift is what they call this, west wind drift. Uh, they say it's a wind driven. I'm pretty sure it's a combination of wind and the Earth's rotation. Because the wind is caused by the Earth's rotation too down there. So that's the west wind drift. That's almost constant. Here's our good old Gulf Stream up here, which does a great job of keeping all of our uh, eastern seaboard free of ice year round, does the same maybe for a little bit of Canada, but then you've got the um, Newfoundland currents coming down here that tend to freeze northern Canada, so that is competing uh, currents here, but the north, the Gulf Stream continues on up here and keeps England and Ireland and Scotland free of ice, so pretty much Scotland up here is just pretty cold. Uh, and then twist around down here. Poor old Scandinavia and the rest of the North Sea, even though it's about the same latitude as England, it gets frozen over. And poor old Russia, they don't have any ports that don't freeze over in the wintertime. That's why they were so eager to get Crimea, uh, which is in the, is it Caspian or, or Black Sea? But, you know, when they were Soviet Union, it was perfectly fine because they were all together. Yeah, it's in the Black Sea. And that is probably it. That's Russia's only ice free port year round. What is it, the temperature or something? What's that? That's the temperature of the region. Yes, they're further south. Okay. Yeah. And uh, now, Russia also has entrance in the Black Sea here, but they don't have any good ports there. Uh, but uh, Ukraine had them, and Russia used those ports under the Soviet Union, 
And then when they split back up, and that became Ukraine, a separate country, Russia wanted that back. So, and they went in together. That's been a lot of political uh, hard feelings. Because the Black Sea dumps through the isthmus here of, uh, what, what do they call that? In Turkey, I can't think of the name of that passageway, but that's how they get back to the sea. So over here on the west coast of Russia, ice like crazy. All the potential <clears throat> ice up like crazy in there. Certainly anything up here is worthless, probably all year long. So even though they have a lot of shoreline, they're not great ports because they freeze over. So all these things act together. Uh, just a few more of the currents. Uh, well, I'll let you look at them. I, I can't read all of them here. But you see they're just all over the place. Uh, twisting around. Here are those gyres. You can see it right here. See, here's one in the southern Pacific. Here's one. It's hard to see it in the northern Pacific. Here's one in the Indian Ocean. Here's one in South Atlantic. Here's one in the North Atlantic. See, they go in opposite directions, north and south. Okay, those are the gyres, the great systems of water movement. Here's the edge of one here that you don't see all over the Pacific here because that's where this flips up. So anyway, those are the gyres, and those are just some of those ocean currents. Okay? Now. Whoa. Okay. Let's talk now about what they call the ocean floor. So this is section 24.3. And at the top of this page, there's a blurb on Rachel Louise Carson, a U.S. biologist, conservationist, and campaigner. Her writings on conservation and the dangers and hazards of many modern practices imposed on the environment inspired the creation of the modern environmental movement. She's largely responsible for it. I'll let you read that. She is... Uh, uh, She's written a couple of books. The Sea Around Us, I think, was one. Uh, the Edge of the Sea was another. The Silent Spring, I think, is her most famous book. Um, so anyway, good little blurb on her. If you choose her for a paper topic, good topic. But this cannot be a source. This can be your idea, but you'll have to go outside the book to get your source. Okay, so let's move on to the ocean floor. Okay. Now, there are some things we do know about the ocean floor, but there's a lot we do not. Especially on our Atlantic side, okay, we have a pretty decent, what they call a continental shelf. Okay? Um, let's see if we can get the graphic up to talk about it. Um, if you, like I said, I was in Virginia Beach. I guess that's the major beach I've been to on the Atlantic side. I went to Charleston once, but didn't really go out. Uh, but in Virginia Beach, you can go, it seems like hundreds of feet out, still be walking. And then you'll suddenly hit a sandbar and you'll be walking on top of it, you know, above the water. And then you'll drop down a little more, and it goes on for a long time. That's called the continental shelf. Now, it can be eroded uh, at the continental margins, okay? In other words, what was land here is eroded away, and this maybe used to have been a beach up here, but it's eroded away, so now it's below water. That's what they're suggesting your continental shelf was. It's relatively shallow water. And you may not be able to walk in it all, but sometimes you have to swim a little ways and you can walk in it some more. So it moves on out there for quite a ways. That's mostly on our east coast. Okay. Then they have what they call the continental slope. That probably was the original boundary, and that's where the continent dropped off, and you're moving down into the thing, continental slope. It's steeper 
the, a steeper transition feature beyond the top middle shelf. Okay, here's Rakiria. Yep. And Donald. Okay. Has anyone else come in? I didn't acknowledge you when you came in. I want to make sure I do catch everybody. Okay. And by the way, uh, Ms. Lewis was telling me that I had her down for an absence that wasn't an absence. What has happened, they have removed people from the role and I not realize it, and sometimes put them back in the role and I not realize it. And sometimes when I'm putting the attendance in, I'm just going down the list and I may be put an absent by someone I thought that was their, that's where their name used to be, but it's not there anymore. So I've got to go back and check some of those. I don't think it makes a lot of difference, but I will go back and check. So anyway, uh, the continental slope is a steeper transition feature beyond the continental shelf, like here, often cut up by submarine canyons, just like we have a canyon, Grand Canyon or other canyons on Earth's surface, you have them in the water too, where maybe a sandy portion gets washed out, a uh, harder rocky portion stays there, and so you get the canyon form too. Then somewhere out here you reach what they call the ocean basin. The deepest part of the ocean generally, characterized by practically level, it's not abysmal, but abyssal, I guess is how you say it, plain. And that's what we call it here. That's what they call the ocean basin. Okay? Now, it says practically level, but they're also Every now and then, a mountain, okay? These are called sea mounts, okay? Something rising up suddenly from that. Uh, sometimes that could have been volcanic. Other times, probably most of the time was volcanic. And then sometimes you'll run into the trenches. They usually occur along the ocean basin edges where the ocean, we talked about this in chapter, what was it, probably 18, where the ocean crust subducts underneath the continental crust. That's what we have on the west coast. Okay? Our east coast looks like this. Our west coast. Thank you. Looks more like that. And like I said, I can remember going out from San Francisco Bay through the Golden Gate and if they were taking soundings and stuff, just all of a sudden the bottom got way down there and then it started coming back up. That was the oceanetic trench. That's where the Pacific plate was subducting under the Pacific plate, uh, the uh, North American plate. Okay. Now, you have volcanic peaks that form scattered seamounts. These were the seamounts. Sometimes they reach the surface, like the Hawaiian Islands, like this one would create the uh, Iceland and its islands, and then all those island chains, for instance, uh, Japan, the string of islands that make up the country of Japan, they were volcanic seamounts at one time that kept growing until they passed the surface, just like the Hawaiian Islands did. Okay? And boy, do we not understand most about the ocean floor. Okay. Now, this graphic is pretty, in my mind, it probably shows how little we know about it. This is our best guesses of what we understand about the oceans now. Of course, what is this line, this little light blue line that makes its way down here from Iceland, down here. We talked about this in an earlier chapter. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, sometimes it's called, or, uh, yeah, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and that's what this one is. That is a uh, divergent plate boundary uh, where the uh, plates are dealt spreading apart, and you have that ridge there. You have ridges in the Pacific, 
all over along the Pacific. You have ridges in the uh, Indian Ocean between Australia and Antarctica. Uh, lots of different ridges there. I don't know if they all are uh, diverging plates, but you do have the ridges along there. They could just be island chains or, or um, plate subductions. Uh, that could cause them too. Okay. But not only do you have the ridges, you have the trenches. And as you might expect, the trenches occur where subduction zones are. This would be where the Pacific plate subducts underneath the uh, North American plate. The Nazca plate subducts under the South American plate. The uh, Pacific plate subducts along under the Aleutian Island chain. Uh, there is a the Puerto Rican uh, uh, trench where this string of islands, Cuba, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rica, uh, that is an island chain where there is a trench. There's part of the uh, North Atlantic subducts underneath that portion. And then you have other trenches over here in Indonesia, near New Zealand, uh, near the Philippines, the Philippine Trench. The Marianas Trench here, anyone know why that's fairly famous? Yes. The deepest point on the globe. The deepest point of the Earth's crust is the Marianas Trench. It's way, way, way down there. There's the Japanese Trench. This is probably where the uh, earthquake happened that created the tsunami that blew out the nuclear power plant, Fukushima. That was along this trench. There's another one up here, Kuril or something like that. There's just all sorts of them. The trenches. They probably don't even name all of them, but they list several of them here. Bridges and trenches. Any questions? Yes. Is uh, the Mariana Trench a Rick Valley? The what? Is the Mariana Trench a Rip Valley? Uh, I don't know what you mean by a Rip. Well, there's two comments right here on the diagram about the Mid Atlantic. Um, Okay. Uh, rift. Oh, okay. I'm, okay. I thought you said rip. I thought you were going back to rip tides and currents. I thought no, I'm lost. Okay, no, no. The rift valley that is a divergent place, and the the. Uh, Magma comes up here, pours down the side, that's what forms, and the sort of the trench in the middle is called the Rift Valley. Okay, so that's a diver. The Marianas Trench is a subductive zone, like this, where the one plate goes underneath the other. It's a convergent boundary where the oceanic plate subducts under another oceanic plate, and that's what causes the Marianas Trench there. So in a deep part of the ocean, and then one plate went even deeper underneath another one, causing an enormous trench there. The Marianas Islands, that chain, to me the most famous of those islands is Guam. Uh, I've actually been on Guam, but I didn't know anything about the Marianas Trench then, or I might would have tried to get a tour to go see it, but you wouldn't have seen it because it's so far underwater. I mean, so incredibly far underwater. Who was the guy that did the original Star Wars? What was his name? Uh, yeah, Lucas. He got to, when they finally built a submergible that could withstand the pressures to get you down to the Marianas Trench, he was, if not the first, one of the first people who got to go down there because he was, I think he maybe helped fund it, you know, and so he got the trip down there. But it's so incredibly dark there, you could hardly see anything. But what you saw was amazing, they said. The animals, the it just it was just so far down there, 
it's a, a different world, another world completely, you know. And those animals have to withstand incredible amounts of pressure. If you probably try to bring one to the surface, they'd probably explode, literally, because they're... So those are the ridges and the trenches. And they named several of them on this graphic. Oh, my goodness, that is the end of the chapter. And that's also the end of the course, okay? That's it. That's all, folks. Uh, yeah, we are going to have a lab today. Yeah, on chapter 24, okay? And it's just going to be a paper lab, so you will need books. If you don't have a book, you're going to have to get together with someone who does have one. I can let mine be used, too, but how many books are in the room? Oh, several of you have them. Okay. Well, then, uh, be prepared to get those out. But let me go through my spiel. Guess what? Nothing replaces reading the chapters. So please go back and read the chapters before Thursday so you'll be really up on it before we have the test. Um, after you've read, thank you. After you've read the chapters, chapter, then the summary is here, and this is probably an average to maybe about average size summary. has a lot of italicized words. Those would be the ones I would focus the most on. Uh, those probably correspond pretty well to the key terms, and this list is maybe a little on the short side or about normal for key terms. But then applying the concepts, and I believe this is where um, Jerome was, was referring uh, that he had been reading doing some of these. 46 of those, that's probably just a tad fewer than normal, but pretty close. Questions for thought, only 13. That's just a little bit fewer than normal. For further analysis, those six is normal to maybe on the big side, usually four or five. And then parallel exercises, those are like those uh, examples given in the text or exercises given in the text. So you can look at those if you'd like. But I think the applying the concepts is probably the best study tool you got. The answers are given right there at the end, but try to do them without looking at the answers, then go back and figure out why you missed it. Like uh, Jerome asked earlier about, wait, why is there just one? Why isn't it three? Because of the wording of it, and they were pretty tricky in their wording. It's actually one big contiguous ocean, but we split it up into regions that we call the various oceans. I would have said the same thing you did, three, but that's not what they were meaning. All right, any questions on chapter 24? Okay. And let me, uh, I think I will end the slideshow and in the CD and for those who did come in later still have had zero word from Jerry Trace here at channel 13 so I don't I know nothing I've been trying I've called emailed multiple times and just cannot get a response um, Hopefully, I will hear something today or tomorrow. It's going to be tough to try to arrange the transportation with such short time that we've got, but I'll try to get it done. If I can't get a van, can we make it there carpooling and stuff? You think we can? So I'll try my best to get the van, but I can't guarantee it. Uh, so anyway, we'll try for Thursday at the very latest Tuesday, and... Uh, that's all. That's all we got left. Um, now, we'll do the lab for Chapter 24 now. Then we will do on, if we go to the Channel 13, most of the time they want to set the 2 o'clock time frame. So we won't have time to do anything on Thursday, but just leave and go there. But when we come back from there, I'll return your papers to you. So I need all the labs and all the tests finished today or tomorrow 
or before class on Thursday. Okay? All of them. Anything not done, losing points. Okay? Now, so Thursday, if we do get to go, we'll go probably at 2. That's what time they usually say to come. Then we'll come back here and have the test on Chapter 24. Okay? And uh, I'll return papers to you, and then we'll have the test on Chapter 24. If we don't get to go on Thursday, but he can take us on Tuesday, then what we'll do on Thursday is report on your research papers. So that means, and by the way, they are due by Thursday because Tuesday of next week is final exam day. So the research papers are due by the last day of class, which is Thursday, day after tomorrow, Thursday. Okay, so you ought to have your papers in by then, and then you can report on the papers, and that will count as a lab. If you do any kind of report, five to ten minute report, that will count as a lab for you, 25 points just for reporting. Okay, so get your papers done, and be prepared if we don't get to go to the, the uh, uh, Channel 13 weather, be prepared to uh, report if you choose. It'll be an optional one, uh, but you can get an extra lab score that way. If we do get to go to the station, we won't have time to report. Okay. Well, if we don't get to go to the station and we do reports on Thursday, have the test on Chapter 24 on Thursday, then... Tuesday, if we do get to go to the station, as soon as we get back from that, we'll have the test, uh, the final exam. Okay, that's scheduled for Tuesday. Okay. If we don't get to go to the station either day, then Tuesday, what we'll do is come in here, have pizza, and then take your final exam. So, uh, uh, but we'll talk about that when we see what's happening with the other. Okay. Um, and I will return everything on my desk by tomorrow, I mean Thursday, day after tomorrow. It's all going back. So anything not turned in today, tomorrow, or before class on Thursday, not going to get scored. What's okay. that piece we're going to do? What's that? What's that piece we're going to do? Well, yeah, we'll, what kind or what? Yeah, what kind? Varieties. What kind? Both? Huh? Yeah, I, I'll let you all decide what kinds you want. I'll ask. Okay? Uh, I'm going to have to get Little Caesars. That's the only one close enough to get. Uh, and they have cheese, pepperoni, sausage, I think three meat, they, and they may have some others. I don't know. But I'll let y'all decide which kind you want and how many you want. Okay. So, any questions about how we're going to wrap up? There's a lot of question marks because we don't know about the field trip. But with that in mind, let's do the lab for today. Goodness, this is a heavy step. Okay. Yeah, if you want to take a break first, you certainly can, and I'll start passing out. I may just pass out. Uh, I'll turn off the recorder now, and I know some of you are already working on it. Let me go over the lab. It's just a paper lab. You can use your book. If you don't have a book, I have one, but there's several people with books, so you can go together as groups. Okay, but I've got one up here if anyone wants it. Uh, you'll find in the book, I know in a figure, the three major watersheds in the continental U.S. I uh, believe you'll also find a map that shows the three largest oceans on the earth, and it says list two continents. Okay, y'all know the difference between continents and countries, right? Yeah. Okay, continents that border each of the oceans. Some of these continents will be used two or three times, okay? Uh, then, name eight major seas, and you'll find some graphic in your book that lists at least eight seas, but then lists a country, now not a continent, but a country, mm -hmm. that borders each of those seas, okay? And you'll see that from your book. Then name 10 of the ocean currents. And again, you'll see a graphic in the book that lists these. Uh, and then the, an ocean with which each is associated. Okay? 
and those are oceans, not seas, oceans. Okay? Then, and that goes, number four goes bottom of the first page, top of the second page. And then, name four of the larger ridges on the Earth's ocean floor, and which ocean is associated with each. So that's the uh, four ridges. And number six, 12 of the larger trenches on the Earth's floor. And you, again, you'll see a graphic with those listed and the ocean in which each is associated. Okay? And let me get Kaya here. Well, my goodness, I already had you here, so I marked someone in the wrong place. Asia marked in the wrong place. Okay. So we're still missing Bridget. Sherlanda with Drew, she said, right? Yeah, um, the Titans would have come, you would have brought me out. What's that? If the Titans wouldn't have come, you would have brought me out. I can't hear. If the Titans wouldn't have come, you would have had me out. No, I would have re remembered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With Sherlanda with Drew. Okay. Katie's not here. Brenda's not here. Got Miss Lewis here, blah blah blah. Tiffany's not here yet. Kaylee's not here yet. And Shakaya's not here yet. Why is this three oceans instead of four? I'm sorry? Why is this three uh, oceans instead of four? To support Arctic. Okay. Uh, it says the three largest oceans. Largest. I'm so sorry. <laughs> This is the second time this happened to me today. Yeah. <laughs> See, uh, just read the question. Uh, no problem. No problem at all. I'd rather you ask questions and do it wrong. Okay. The three largest The three largest That's why I phrased it that way. All right. Do you think there'll be any more questions on the lab? Anybody? Okay, want me to go on and upload? Any reason not to upload? Okay, so we'll get it out there sooner.